On behalf of the Berkeley Research and Contemporary India program, please be seated, sir. The Institutes of International Study and South Asian Studies at the University of California, Berkeley. I would like to welcome all of you to hear Mr. Rahul Gandhi speak on India at 70, Reflections on the Path Forward. My name is Pradeep Chibber. I teach political science on campus, and I'm a co-moderator of this event. Mr. Gandhi is a political leader, and Berkeley is known both for its diversity of political views as well as its commitment to free speech. I expect a robust political debate. To hear all voices and to hear them respectfully, I would like to stress the need for civility. Free speech and academic freedom are foundational values for the University of California at Berkeley. As Chancellor Carol Christ noted in her message to campus at the beginning of the semester, the public expression of many sharply divergent points of view is fundamental both to our democracy and to our mission as a university. UC Berkeley is committed to the belief that speech we may not or agree with should be confronted with more speech rather than censorship. We ask that you as audience members be respectful of the speaker and refrain from any disruptive behavior. Some of you may disagree with today's topic or his answers and may have other differences with our invited speaker. However, please respect the spirit of this forum and the rest of the audience by allowing our guest this opportunity to speak. Please do not stand, shout, or engage in any other behavior that disrupts the event or prevents the speaker from being heard or completing the presentation. Anyone who disrupts the event may be asked to leave the campus, and if police action is necessary, this could lead to criminal action, citation, or even arrest. Students or campus affiliates may, fi may might also face administrative consequences for disruptive behavior. You should have received an index card as you enter this auditorium. If you have a question for Mr. Gandhi, please write your question down on an index card. An affiliate of the Institute of In for International Studies will collect the cards throughout the lecture prior to the question and answer por portion of our event. Mr. Gandhi will address the audience first, followed by the moderated question and answer. We ask that you remain in your seats during this time. This event is streaming live. We ask that you do not video record this event. If you are seen video recording, you may be asked to leave the auditorium. This event was initiated by Berkeley undergraduates with the able help of Mr. Milan Deora, whose responsiveness and attention to detail have been truly extraordinary. Thank you, Mr. Deora. I would also like to thank the Institute of South Asia Studies and three affiliates of the Institute of International Studies, Ariana, Savan, and Elliot, who have worked hard to make this possible. None of this would have, would have been possible, however, without one person who coordinated all of the many, many pieces that are needed to get somebody like Mr. Gandhi to campus, Rex Louis, the redoubtable administrative director of IIS, and I would urge all of you to give a big hand to Rexel. <laughs> Harsh Shah, who is a Berkeley alum and my co-moderator, will introduce the Berkeley Research and Contemporary India program and Mr. Gandhi. Harsh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Professor. Um, and thank you all for attending and viewing this event. I'll start by talking a little bit about our program and then go on to introduce our speaker today. The Berkeley Research and Contemporary India program was started two years ago uh, with the aim of facilitating a deeper relationship between Berkeley and India, primarily by bringing in prominent Indians to Berkeley, hosting conferences both in Berkeley and in India, and most importantly, supporting student research on contemporary India. We've previously hosted speakers like Dr. Tharoor and Mr. Milan Devra, both of whom are in attendance today. And we've also included or hosted other, other eminent individuals from India, including Rajdeep Sardesai, Sagrika Ghosh, and Pratap Bhanu Mehta. The program is supported by the generosity of donors in India, and the philanthropy of these donors is also making it possible to have another signature event called the Berkeley India Conference, which will be held at this campus on October 7th and 8th. The two-day conference will see politicians, academics, journalists, and business leaders discuss and debate various different socio-political issues surrounding India uh, across keynotes and panel discussions. Coming to today's event, our speaker, Mr. Rahul Gandhi, hardly needs an introduction. Mr. Gandhi is currently Vice President of the Indian National Congress and the Chairperson of the Youth Congress. 
and he's also a three-time member of parliament. He led the Congress party in the 2014 general elections and various state elections, and is leading the reorganization of the party following the electoral defeat in 2014. Mr. Gandhi's father, Rajiv Gandhi, great-grandmother -gra Indira Gandhi, and great-grandfather, Mr. Jawaharlal Nehru, were all prime ministers of India. His lecture today follows in the footsteps of a historic speech delivered on the Berkeley campus by Mr. Nehru in 1949. Mr. Gandhi, thank you for joining us today, and the floor is yours. Thank you, Dr. Chibber, for inviting me here. Thank you, Harsh, and I'd like to welcome all of you here this evening. Today happens to be the 11th of September, so I'd like to start by paying homage to all the people who died on this day and all the people who lost loved ones. We stand with them today in their memory. As a politician, we get to go to many places and listen to many different people. And I'm going to start today by telling you a little story. Um, many years ago, you'd remember that there was a huge tsunami that came to India. And it hit the Andaman and Nicobar Islands. And one of the things that we were doing at the time was trying to send aid to the Andaman and Nicobar Islands. And I was, looking, I was looking at a list of people who had died. And there's many communities who live on the Andaman and Nicobar Islands. And I noticed in the list that there were absolutely no tribal people who had died. So I asked some of the people there, I said, listen, how has this happened? I said, there's many, many people who've died. There's lots of tribals living in Andaman and Nicobar, but I don't see a single tribal person who's died in the tsunami, what happened? So then one of the people there told me, they said, you know, Mr. Gandhi, when a tsunami comes, the sea goes out. And when the sea goes out, huge numbers of fish are left stranded. And he said the tribals, they knew that when a tsunami goes out, when the tsunami comes in, just prior to it, the sea goes out. Whereas the non-tribals didn't know this. And when the tsunami came, the sea went out, all the non-tribals ran to get the fish. And all the tribals ran into the hills. And some of the tribals told the non-tribals that don't go there. You're going to get killed. But they didn't listen. They ran into the sea. And that's why no tribals died. And as someone, as a liberal today, that's exactly how I feel. Everybody knows that something has gone very wrong in the system. And the right-wing politicians are saying, go there and pick up the fish. And people are sort of Looking at the simple answers, they're looking at the simple answers, but you're not going to get a result from the simple answers. And one of the reasons I've come here, and this is a tremendous institution, but this institution believes in a liberal ideology, it believes in discussion, it believes in listening to people, it believes in conversations. And you have a tremendous history, and I respect that history. As you, Mr. Chibber, said, my great-grandfather came here and gave a, gave a speech. So I'd like to thank you very much for inviting me here. I'm going to speak for about 15, 20 minutes, and then we're going to have a conversation you can ask me all the questions you'd like. 
India is a massive country. It is also one of the world's most complex countries. Every time you think you've understood India, she will reveal something new to you. In fact, I would venture to say, anyone who thinks he understands India is a fool. According to most Western academics and intelligence agencies in the middle of the last century, India was supposed to fail. We are 29 states covering every religion in the world. We have seven, 17 official languages and hundreds of different dialects and a terrain that runs from the Himalayas all the way to the desert. Most of these experts didn't expect India to survive. They predicted it would fall apart, torn to pieces by its own diversity and contradictions. And yet somehow, as Indira Gandhi said when asked whether India leans left or right, India came out standing straight and tall. The idea of nonviolence or ahimsa, as we call it in India, is what has allowed this huge mass of people to rise up together. Uniting India's religions, castes, and languages would simply be impossible without it. It is this idea that Mahatma Gandhi fashioned into a powerful but beautiful political weapon. The common conception in the West is that people have ideas. You all say, I have an idea. But there's an alternate, alternative way of looking at the world. The counterintuitive notion that instead of people having ideas, that ideas have people. So instead of I have an idea, an idea has me. This notion is the basis of ahimsa or nonviolence as taught by Gandhi. If one accepts the notion that ideas capture people, then the only possible response to a person infected by a bad idea, any person, is love and compassion. The only action you can take against him is to try and rid him of the bad idea and replace it with a good one. Using violence against a person who is infected by a bad idea actually results in the idea spreading more aggressively, multiplying among the people who care for him and love him. This nonviolent philosophy in action has traveled far beyond India. Nonviolence is not inaction, Cesar Chavez said. It is not discussion. It is not for the timid and weak. Nonviolence is hard work. It is this very idea, this beautiful struggle, that is viciously under attack in India today. But it is also the only idea on which humanity can survive the connectivity of the 21st century and come out unscathed stronger. The road traveled by India since independence has been difficult and filled with formidable obstacles. Our partition was the bloodiest migration in recorded history. At independence, most of our 400 million people were hungry. Yet the achievements of India have been significant. Increasing literacy, expanding healthcare, and raising life expectancy all within a generation. Achieving self-sufficiency in food grains, averting famine, pushing huge advantages in science and technology, even being a front runner in the field of computer technology. When Mr. Rajiv Gandhi and my dear friend Sam Petroda, who's sitting here, spoke about bringing the computer to India, there were voices that ridiculed them. In fact, a leader of the BJP who became prime minister later asked the question, what does India need computers for? Why do we need computers? Imagine that. When India built the IITs, the entire world, including many in India, were highly critical of the idea that a poor country should waste money on such technical institutions. They reacted to us with skepticism, wondering why a country like ours would need such institutions. 
Today, these IITs and other higher education institutions in India play a central role in Silicon Valley and the global progress of technology. And yet, look at us today. We are rightly proud. We have done that and more, lifting hundreds of millions of people out of poverty. For everything everyone says about India, there is no democratic country in human history and I'll repeat that. There's no democratic country in human history that has raised as many people out of poverty as India has. It has never been done. And, and we have not done it with violence. We've not done it with, by killing people. We have done it peacefully together. For the first time in our history, India if it is steered correctly and faithfully, has the opportunity to wipe out poverty. If India is able to lift another 350 million people out of poverty by 2030, it would be an achievement of which the human race can be proud. Doing this will require us to grow at more than 8% over the next 13 years. India has done it before and can do it again. But it is imperative that India sustain a high growth rate for an uninterrupted period of 10 to 15 years in order to do so. At the heart of this powerful engine that India has built with its blood, sweat, and bare hands since 1947 are jobs and economic growth. No amount of growth is enough for India if it is not accompanied by the creation of jobs. It doesn't matter how fast you grow. If you are not creating jobs, you're not actually solving the problem. So the central challenge for India is jobs. Roughly 12 million young people, 12 million, enter the Indian job market every year. Nearly 90% of them have a high school education or less. India is a democratic country, and unlike China, it has to create jobs in a democratic environment. India does not have and nor does it want China's coercive instruments. We cannot follow their model of massive factories controlled by fear. Jobs in India are going to come instead from small and medium scale industry. India needs to turn colossal numbers of small and medium businesses into international companies. Currently, all the attention in India is paid to the top 100 companies. Everything is geared towards them. Banking systems are monopolized by them. The doors of government are always open to them. And laws are shaped by them. Meanwhile, entrepreneurs running small and medium businesses struggle to get bank loans. They have no protection and no support. Yet these small and medium businesses are the bedrock of India and the world's innovation. Big businesses can easily manage the unpredictability of India. They're protected by their deep, deep pockets and connections. But the real innovative strength of India lies with the millions of small firms and young entrepreneurs that run them. And they're relying on us to build the financial, communication, and political infrastructure that would allow them to turn their skills into global businesses. Healthcare in the 21st century is being revolutionized. Today, a doctor examines you, analyzes your data, and tells you what's wrong with you. All this is based on his memory. When he retires, that information is lost. Tomorrow, all the medical data is going to be digitized and accessible on computers. Two factors will determine competitiveness in healthcare. First, the type and volume of different medical processes and procedures that are taking place in a country. And second, the genetic diversity of your population. India's size will give it huge advantages. The sheer fact that India performs millions of cataract operations or heart surgeries a year, for example, means we are going to be the best at doing them. But much more important than scale will be India's rich genetic diversity. Thousands of years of cross-culturalism means that India has the world's most genetically diverse population. If medical processes are going to be based on DNA, then India's diversity is going to be a huge global asset. 
So if you're looking at medical processes in the 21st century, by far the best opportunities for groundbreaking research and innovation will be in India. It is imperative that we start thinking about these systems now and while addressing the critical concerns of privacy and ownership before they arise. Done properly, this can transform India's healthcare system and while at the same time help the world beyond our borders. India has triggered a massive process of human transformation. The nature of, in, the nature of India's transformation has now reached a stage where its momentum is so powerful that our failure is no longer an option. Our success impacts the world, but should our country fail, it will shake the entire world. What India is trying to do is to connect 1.3 billion people into the global economy with minimum disruption possible in a peaceful and compassionate way. But don't be confused. If this process breaks down, the potential for violence is massive. I've given you the positives, so before I end, I need to tell you what can go dangerously wrong. Our strength so far has been that we have done all this peacefully. What can destroy our momentum is the opposite energy. Hatred, anger, and violence, and the politics, and the politics of polarization, which has raised its ugly head in India today. Violence and hatred distract people from the task at hand. Liberal journalists being shot, people being lynched because they are Dalits, Muslims killed on suspicion of eating beef. This is new in India and damages India very badly. The politics of hate divides and polarizes India, making millions of people feel that they have no future in their own country. In today's connected world, this is extremely dangerous. It isolates people and makes them vulnerable to radical ideas. Finally, listening to India is very important. She will give you all the answers that you seek. India's institutions have over 70 years built a profound understanding of our country. We have experts in every single field. Ignoring India's tremendous institutional knowledge and taking ad hoc decisions is reckless and dangerous. Decisions like demonetization, which removed 86% of cash from circulation overnight and was carried out unilaterally without asking the chief economic advisor, the cabinet, or even parliament, imposes a devastating cost on India. Currently, we are not producing enough jobs. 30,000 new youngsters are joining the job market every single day, 30,000. And yet, the government is only creating 500 jobs a day. And this does not include the massive pool of already unemployed youngsters. The decline in economic growth today is worrying and is leading to an upsurge of anger in the country. The government's economic policies, demonetization, and a hastily applied GST have caused tremendous damage. Millions of small businesses were simply wiped out as a result of demonetization. Farmers and manual laborers who use cash were hit extremely hard. Agriculture is in deep distress, and farmer suicides have skyrocketed across the country. Demon demonetization, a completely self-inflicted wound, caused approximately 2% loss in India's GDP. India cannot afford to grow and create jobs at the current rate. If we continue at the current rate, if India cannot give the millions of people entering the job market employment, anger will increase, and it has the potential to derail what has been built so far. That will be catastrophic for India and the world beyond it. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Yeah. So while the cards are being collected and the questions given, I thought I'd start off. Uh, you spoke very touchingly and movingly about the lists of um, the dead people you were going through in the tsunami and of the violence and hatred that exists in India today. But this is Berkeley, and there are people outside who are protesting your presence here because they say, you know, you were a child when the riots in Delhi happened in 1984. 
but there still remains a sense of unease and dissatisfaction among the Sikh community that justice has not been served. You know, I was, I was 14 years old, and I was in my geography class. And I got a phone call in school that I should come home. And I went home, and my grandmother had been shot 32 times. But what many people don't know was that the people who shot my grandmother, her bodyguards, were my friends. And I used to play badminton with them. So on one day, I saw my grandmother shot, and I saw my friends shot. I understand. I understand what violence does. And it doesn't matter against who it's done. As I said in my speech, violence against anybody is wrong. And I condemn it. And I fully support any action that is taken against anybody who's carried out violence. In fact, I'm with them in their quest for justice, 100%. Look, you know, it's quite a strange world. Because my grandmother absolutely loved Sikhs. And I remember in 1977, when my grandmother lost the election, the only people around in our house were Sikhs. And I absolutely love the community. That's just the truth. And if there is anything I can do to help them get justice, I'm the first person who will do it. <laughs> violence, violence will never get you a solution ever. I mean, I'm a believer, a believer in what Mahatma Gandhi says. I've, you know, I've lost my grandmother, I've lost my father. If I don't understand violence, I mean, I'd have to be really ignorant. Thank you for, thank you for that. Um, of course, you've had a very unusual, difficult up upbringing. Uh, you just mentioned these two instances lost your grandmother at the age of 14, you lost your father about seven years after that. How, how have these personal tragedies affected your approach to life and to your politics? I mean, first of all, you know, when you lose, when you lose, uh, people you love, it becomes very clear what is important and what is not important. So that, in my mind, you know, Sam today said to me, you know, let's go, do you want to buy something? So some of those sort of, you know, materialistic ideas, they're just gone. I, I mean, I see other people having them, but I don't understand them. Uh, that's one. The second thing is that, as I said, you know, I was friends with the people who killed my grandmother. And I sat in a room one day. I'll tell you two stories. I sat in a room one day, and a Sikh gentleman came in. And he was a Congress MLA. And he sat down and he said to me, you know, Mr. Gandhi, I can't believe I'm sitting in the same room with you. This was some time back. So I said, why? He said, you know, because 15 years ago, if I'd walked into this room with you, I'd have killed you. Political currents 
shape people in strange ways. They release anger, they make people hate each other, but the only way forward, the guy hugged me after that, the only way forward is to go to the person who's angry with you, talk to him, and understand what it is that is bothering him. That's, that's the only way forward. There's no other way forward. Because if you carry out violence against somebody, it doesn't end there. It will always be a cycle. It'll go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, and won't help anybody. There have been a number of questions raised about, uh, among the audience about the Congress party and where it's headed. So people are curious. Just a couple of things. First is, where do you think the Congress party is falling short, if it is in any way, as an opposition party? And over the last three years, you've had some time to think and introspect. What have you learned about rebuilding a party organization in these few years? See, any party in India that is in power for 10 years will run into a problem. It's just natural. India is a complex country. Normally, you don't win more than a term in a row. And we won two terms. The vision that we had laid out in 2004 was designed at best for a 10-year period. And it was pretty clear that the vision that we had laid out in 2004, by the time we arrived at 2010-11, it was already not working anymore. And the Congress party, unlike the BJP and the RSS, is basically a, a conversation. Most of my work is sitting in a room listening to people. This is what I think, 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 and collecting all that information, and then coming out with a solution that makes everybody happy. So the way we design policies, or the way we design a vision, is not by standing up there and saying, listen, this is what I think I'm going to tell you, this is what we're going to do. We design a vision by having a conversation. And somewhere around 2012, and I'll say this, a certain arrogance crept into the Congress party. And they stopped having that conversation. So rebuilding the Congress party is a couple of things. One is designing a vision that India can use going forward. If you, look at, if you look at most of the things the BJP is doing, they're basically what we said. They're central programs. They said they'd finish off Narega. They carried it on. GST is our program. So the central architecture is a, they've borrowed from us. But that architecture doesn't work. We know it, because it stopped working. So for us, there's two things. One is make a transition, and a smooth one, between the sort of senior people and younger people. You can't just brush aside all senior people. So you have to bring people together, you have to put some new faces, you have to put some old faces, that's a compromise. So that's, that's one aspect. But the main thing is, you know, what I said there, India has unleashed four, five hundred million people. And now it's not good enough for us to say that we're not going to give them a vision. It can't be done. Because if you don't give them a vision, then you enter a very dangerous space. And really what has happened is if you look at India from about 2012, and we are to blame for at least two to three years of that, India has basically lost its vision. And that, that conversation has to be had. You said something interesting about a 
the central architecture doesn't work. Could you say a little bit more about why you think the central architecture that you had put in place has stopped working or doesn't it's work? Not, so well? It's not only ours. It's not only ours. You know, some years back, a, a leader from one of the European countries came, and I was having a chat with him. And I asked him a very simple question. I said, you know, I understand all this you're saying to me about globalization. Just answer me one question. Because I don't understand how you're going to get that answer. I said, what is it? I said, please explain to me how you intend to get employment for the large majority of your population, the blue collar space. How are you going to get employment for those people? And his answer shocked me. He said, I can't. And I said, well, if you can't, there's going to be a real problem. And he's like, yeah, there's going to be a real problem. What two things have happened. The first thing is, if you look at who is producing jobs, pretty much the only country that is actually producing jobs at scale is China. They're doing so because they have a particular type of coercive machinery. They have a particular type of environment where they can manage factories with 30,000 people, 50,000 people. Most other countries are struggling to give jobs to blue collar workers. So that's one problem. And you can see the rise of the right wing leaders. Their core constituency is that group of people who are basically not able to get a job. And then a second thing has happened. Earlier, institutions had monopoly over their information. So if you were a judge, you basically controlled the courtroom, and you controlled the processes. If you're a school teacher, what you said basically was what the classroom took away. Connectivity has basically ripped those institutions apart. So a judge might believe he has dominance over his information space. But then suddenly, somebody makes a mini-series and is questioning what the judge has done. A teacher is questioned by his students, say, no, actually, I don't agree with that. I just read on the internet that you're wrong. So this combination of inability to produce jobs at scale and institutions not firing properly is what is the problem. I'll ask one follow-up on that. So some of the reasons institutions don't work is corruption, and people in the audience are asking, which is that, you know, there's a fair bit of corruption in India, and your party is for right or wrong, we are you know, stigmatized by it. So what do you think should be done to actually address this issue? I think there's two things. One of the things that we did was the right to information. And what the right to information did was massively increase transparency. So a lot of the problem that we faced was actually because of a massive increase in transparency that we created. Which, by the way, Mr. Modi has shut down. So Mr. Modi has basically clamped down on the, on the RTI, on the right to information. So the amount of information that was flying around in our time is simply not flying around. So one reason we got into quite a lot of trouble was because we dramatically increased the amount of transparency. But if you want to take on corruption in India, corruption happens because of arbitrary centralized power. You have to crack arbitrary centralized power. You have to decentralize power. Unless you decentralize power, you're not going to take on the corruption issue. So moving in a slightly different direction, you know, 
you, you, you've stressed the need for designing a good, strong vision for any party, for the Congress to revive its fortunes. Now, you also need someone to sell that vision effectively. And Mr. Modi has done that quite well for the BJPs. Now, you know, when the UPA was in power, there was a huge clamor to have you come in to the executive, become a cabinet minister, some said prime minister. In 2014, they wanted you to be prime minister, your candidate, which you, which you declined. And you're very likely going to face the same demand in 2019. So are you ready to now take charge in an executive take charge of executive I, role in the Congress party? I'm, I'm absolutely ready to do that. But the way our party works, we have an organizational election process that decides that. And that process is currently ongoing. So we, we have an internal system where we elect certain delegates who make that decision. So for me to say uh, that that decision is mine, uh, that wouldn't be very fair. That's a decision that the Congress party has to make, uh, and that's a process that's currently going on right now. But you are open to it. Yeah, sure. Great. <laughs> <laughs> but, but that idea that the Congress has is delegative and there are discussions actually runs counter to the common perception, at least among the media and among academics and among lots of people and among this audience which wants to know. But isn't the Congress party associated with more dynastic politics? What you see, what you see is... <laughs> okay. Actually, most parties in India have that problem. Fair enough. <laughs> so, fair. so don't give us stick because Mr. Akhilesh Yadav is a dynast. Mr. Stalin is a dynast. Mr. Dhummal's son is a dynast. So, you know, even Abhishek Bachchan is a dynast. I mean, that's how India runs. So, so do, I mean, don't, don't, don't get after me because that's how the entire country is running. By the way, last I recall, Mr. Ambani's kids were running their business. And that was also going on in Infosys, right? So it's, it's, that's what happens in India. But saying that, I do try to sort of change it in the Congress party. If you look at the Congress party, there's a large number of people who are actually not from dynastic families at all. And I can name them in every state. There are also people who did happen to have uh, a father or a grandmother yes. <laughs> or a great grandfather <laughs> in politics. Yes. They do exist. They do exist. <laughs> There's not much I can do about it. I mean, thank you. But as a quick follow up to that, you know, a lot Sorry, of people. Go, see, go ahead. The, the real question is the real question is is the person actually a capable person? Is the person a sensitive person? That's the question. Yes. Anyway, sorry. No, so as a quick follow-up to that, I know a lot of people in this room itself would love to get involved with politics in India, public sector policy making in some form or the other. Doesn't have to be 24 by 7, but they'd love to get involved. And are unable to figure out what's the best route to do that without having family backing. So what is your suggestion to that, those that, people? That gentleman sitting there, uh, Shashi Tharoor, he, he is, uh, and, and if you're in the United States, Sam Petroda there, uh, Shashi Tharoor has recently taken over a new organization that the Congress is building called the Professionals Congress. Anybody who is interested in joining politics, but not through the sort of um, directly elected system, can go and talk to him. <laughs> but if you're looking to do internships, and you're looking to sort of do po uh, public policy, I'm more than happy to put you in touch with people. Um, you know, there's plenty of people in the Congress party, politicians, who are working on these type of things, I'm more than happy to put you in touch. 
I can get you, I can get your number. <laughs> or an email. Or an email. Thank you. you know, and you mentioned some of, that, that you're trying your best within the Congress to move away from this dynastic system. You've had a lot of internal reforms you've tested out, one of them being the primaries at the local level. But some of them have run into roadblocks, uh, many of them, in fact. And you also attributed to this, to the struggles of navigating between the young and the old. And have you found that that being a big issue and roadblock for you as you've gone ahead with your reform agenda in the Congress? You know, my, my earlier approach was that one should push young people uh, regardless. Uh, I, still, I still believe that as many young people as possible should be push, pushed forward. But there's tremendous talent in the Congress party with some of our senior people. And, you know, it's really unfair to say that, you know, just because you happen to be slightly old, we're not going to utilize you. So it's a mix. Um, it's a mix. It's trying to make both these systems work together. Both, both young and old work together. You know, there's, you know how India works. There's, there's sort of egos and stuff like that. <laughs> When you, read your, when you gave your speech, I found something really striking, which is that you started speaking of removing poverty and through the actions of small-scale industry and businessmen. That sounds to me like a shift away from the old socialist vision that has characterized the Congress Party for a long time. And even within the Congress Party, I think there is some, there was an op-ed written in the Hindustan Times recently arguing for a more leftward shift in the Congress party. But you seem to be artic arguing and articulating a slightly more center right vision, at least as far as economics is concerned. Is that where you think the party you know, should the go? Left, the left right idea, it works very well in Europe and the United States. It doesn't work so well in India. I'll give you an example, right? In the 70s, Congress party does bank nationalization. It's the same party that does liberalization. And they're the opposite thing, yeah. right? And then you can see that the same party on one hand is doing liberalization, on the other hand is doing Narega, right? So actually, what the Congress party does is respond to situations. I mean, people, people say, oh, you know, building the public sector in the 60s was not a good idea. Well, there was no way of building anything other than the public sector in the 60s. But the Congress party moves from the 60s to the 70s to the 80s to the 90s to 2000 to 2010. So we we're not really bound by whether this is left or it's right and we're going to shape ourselves as a left party or right party. We're saying, listen, what needs to be done? Do we need to uh, push small businesses? Is that good for India? Good, let's do it. Do we need to support agriculture? Good, let's do it. There might be a contradiction. But you can't carve the Congress party in that way. Do you feel that at some level right now, the vision, ideology, just exactly what the Congress stands for, that messaging is getting lost as it reach, reaches voters? No, I don't. I think, I think for us, we have never had a top-down vision. So our, you know, do you know where Narega came from? Narega came from a district in Maharashtra. A junior Congress guy in a district found a collector doing Narega. And he was like, wait a minute, this sounds interesting. And then it was brought in, and then it became a national program. So whereas the BJP gives the top-down vision, we construct a bottom-up vision. And we are actually in the process of doing that. We, are, we spent 10 years with our old vision. That served India. Uh, highest economic growth that India ever had was when we were in government. Uh, Narega transformed rural India. 
RTI was an extremely powerful program. But these were all programs that they came from the bottom. And that's the process that we are doing right now. We are having conversations with our people, saying, listen, what is, what's going on in Karnataka? How, what's interesting there? Uh, I think this thing is interesting there. What's going on in Punjab? What, what are you guys doing there? That conversation we are having, and you will see that from that conversation will come something that will excite everybody. But we just don't design it the other way. I can give you a speech here right now and tell you, you know, a top-down vision that you know, we'll get you 50 million jobs and we'll do you this and we'll do you that. That's not the Congress party. I think shifting directions a little bit, on a more personal level, you know, there's a prevailing sentiment that Mr. Rahul Gandhi is a slightly reluctant politician, that you're not very accessible, there's a, there's not a, very open. There's a machine, <laughs> there's, a, there's a BJP machine, about a thousand guys sitting on computers mm -hmm. that basically tell you about me. Okay, they tell you, they tell you I'm reluctant, they tell you I'm stupid, they tell you all these things. You've seen me now, you've seen me now, you guys gotta make up your mind. Right, you gotta figure that out. But, but realize that there is a tremendous machine thousand people or so, that all they do is spread abuse about me. And the operation is basically run by the gentleman who's running our country. <laughs> basically. But so what do you think is the best way you can counter that? How do you address these misperceptions well, more, floating around? Have more conversations like this and give, give people a sense of uh, what I'm like. That's the best way. I have some, uh, there are a number of questions that have come up about, when you, you know, which you talked about, which is these local visions coming and the Congress trying to figure out what the right thing to do is by figuring out, you know, by, uh, through a bottom-up process, and I think that's laudable. But what happens often is that many of the programs and initiatives that people undertake get lost either in a bureaucratic morass. If you remember famously, your father said 15% of the money reaches you know, people at the bottom. So it's very easy on the one hand to say, let's do this and let's do this, but isn't administrative reform in some senses the key to all this? And what we've also discovered all over the world is that the hardest thing to do, and this is speaking from the university which has tried administrative reform and failed miserably, <laughs> right? We have actually. The question is, is administrative reform on the one hand, on, on one hand sounds good, but it's actually an extremely difficult thing to do. So do you have any ideas of making the state machinery work for the people? What do you think you can do to make that happen? You know, administrative reform is important, but much more important than administrative reform is actually political reform. Today, the real problem in India is that our political machinery, the Lok Sabha, the Rajya Sabha, the Vidhan Sabha, they are not empowered the way they should be. So if you look at how decisions are made in the United States, laws are made by the Senate, right? So there are, there are a large number of senators who have a discussion about any law that is made, and then people can go and talk to them and say, you know, I want you to support me on this law. That system simply doesn't exist in India. Laws in India are made by ministers and five or six people surrounding the minister. Until you make that process transparent, until you bring that process out into the open, you're not really going to transform the system. So if the Congress party comes to power next time around, right, inshallah, as they would say, will you actually do this? 100%. I mean, that, that is the only thing I would do. <laughs> to me, to me, to me, if you look at the Lok Sabha, 546 people, to me, that should be 546 institutions, democratic institutions, each one 
fundamentally involved in lawmaking. Today our MPs, they don't make laws. They worry about building roads in villages. And they get punished for not building roads in villages or building roads in villages. They should be making laws. They should be empowered to make laws. That's their job. And that is the fundamental thing that is that's gone wrong in India. People say, you know, many people in the press write, oh, you know, why are there no discussions in parliament that are interesting? I'll tell you why there are no discussions in parliament that are interesting. There's no power in parliament. All the power is outside parliament. The power is in the prime minister's office or the minister's office. You make the members of parliament powerful, the discussion will start in the parliament house. So to me, taking India to the next level is about transforming how our parliament works, is about making sure that our members of parliament are actually involved in lawmaking, that they become part and parcel of the conversation of lawmaking. That would be, that would be one of the things that would I would do. Oh, great. Uh, sorry, we can't take questions from the audience. My, my apologies. There are some people have asked the question of, you know, the way forward, and there are people who are asking the question about what is the way forward in Kashmir, you think? It's a difficult question. No, 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 it's not a difficult question. It's not a difficult question. It's actually an easy question. You know, for nine years, I worked behind the scenes with Prime Minister Manmohan Singh, with Mr. Chitambaram, with Jairam Ramesh, and a large number of people. And we worked silently on Jammu and Kashmir. When we started in 2004, terrorism was rampant in Jammu and Kashmir. By the time we finished in 2013, I went back and I hugged the Prime Minister. And I told him that, you know, one of your biggest successes is the end of violence in Jammu and Kashmir. In 2013, we had basically broken the back of terrorism in Kashmir. And we hadn't done it by giving big lectures and big stories. We hadn't done it by giving big lectures and stories. We had done it silently. I'll tell you how we did it. We did it by holding Panchayati Raj elections. We did it by linking women to banks, self-help groups. We did it by running a program of getting young Kashmiris, young people from Jammu and Kashmir and Ladakh, employment in other parts of India, bringing corporates to Jammu and Kashmir, having conversations like, like this with them, and building their confidence. In fact, the, the bodyguard who I went, I, I went to Jammu and Kashmir is standing right here. And my way of measuring progress, I had two metrics. One metric was how many commercial flights are coming into Jammu and Kashmir. Because the more commercial flights, the more tourism, the more people are comfortable, the better we are doing. And the second was how close these guys stand to me. <laughs> so if these guys are standing like all around me, we're not doing well. And if they're sort of loosening up a bit, we're doing well. So we went from practically no planes to 50 planes. And I remember one day in 2013, when I was looking around and I was like, where are my security guys? And they had like actually loosened up so much. And there was crowds all around me, 100, 100 200 people, and having a conversation. I went back there in 2014, and this gentleman was there with me. And this gentleman, these are his words, not mine. Let's get out of here right now. Otherwise, we're going to be in serious trouble. Right? What happened between 2013 
and 2014 August. I'll tell you. Our strategy was to close the space for terrorists in Kashmir. We basically went in there and said young Kashmiris have two options. They can either be pro-India or they can be against India. Let's close the against India space. Let's find every little space we can find which is not pro-India and shut it down. And we, it took us nine years. Panchayati Raj elections, suddenly the Indian government landed up right in the village. We had Pradhan sitting in the village, managing budgets of a crore, informing us exactly who the terrorists were. Students going to Bombay, to Karnataka, coming back and saying, you know what? Actually, there's opportunity here. So we gave the kids in Jammu and Kashmir a vision. And it was working. And then in 2014, the Indian government did something that inflicted a huge, huge strategic cost on in India. Essentially, there are four political parties in Kashmir. There's the BJP on the extreme right. There's the Congress, nationalist. There's the National Conference. There's the PDP. There's the Hurriyat. And then there's terrorists in Pakistan. The PDP was the instrument that brought young Kashmiri youngsters into the political process. And the day Mr. Narendra Modi made an alliance between the PDP and the BJP, he destroyed the PDP as an instrument that could bring youngsters into the political system. And the day he did that, he massively opened up space for the terrorists in Kashmir, and they came in. And you saw a massive increase in violence. The intelligence guys themselves in Jammu and Kashmir told me that large numbers of the PDP have suddenly gone towards the middle militants. When you take these strategic decisions to take a little bit of political advantage, you do tremendous damage to the country. Today, Jammu and Kashmir, the space in Jammu and Kashmir has been opened up, not only for the Pakistanis, for other players in the region. And it is going to impose a massive, massive strategic cost on India. Just one small decision. So when you go into the details of these things, the answers are not complicated. You talk to people, you give them hope, you give them a vision, it doesn't matter who they are. Whether they're from UP, Kashmir, anywhere, they will engage with you. You build trust with them, they will engage with you. It's not complicated. The reason it doesn't, doesn't happen, those are complicated. What about the current strategic? <laughs> Harsh, you want to ask the next questions? I think we've gotten quite a few questions. But about... what amazed me, you know? Go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> I, this, I'm passionate about this because, because for me, the Jammu Kashmir question is a very important question for our future. You know what amazed me was nine years of work going there, talking to people, nine years, 30 days destroyed. 30 days. And it just, it blew my mind. I was so sad. I was like, my God, nine years. And it can just be wiped out in 30 days. We've gotten quite a few questions on your view of the Modi government's performance. I know you mentioned a couple of things uh, in your speech, demonetization, polarization, violence. 
what are the two or three key things that you wish they could improve on? And maybe the second part, Sorry. what are one or two things that you think the government's actually doing well? See, I'm an opposition leader, but Mr. Modi is also my prime minister. Mr. Modi has certain skills. He's a very good communicator, probably much better than me. He understands how to give a message to three or four different groups in a crowd. So his, his messaging ability is very subtle and very effective. What I sense, and this is something that actually would be very good if it happened. What I sense is that he doesn't converse with the people he works with. I mean, they, even members of parliament or the BJP come to me and tell me that, that you know, sunte nahi. Yeah. No. Uh, please, please, uh, no, please. I'll tell you what, I'll have a conversation with you after this. I'd like you to share with everyone else. After that, you can share it with them, but I'll happily have a conversation. No, please. No. please go ahead. Carry on. What carry on? Where were we? Uh, we were on, you Modi, were talking Mr. about Modi. the Modi government's so, performance. So, so one thing that I think would be good is if he would speak to the people who work with him. I mean, there's a lot of information that the opposition, for example, has. And he's not really interested in that input. So that, that's one aspect of it. On on what they've done well, what I like. I like the concept of Make in India. But the orientation of Make in India is slightly different than what I would do. So the orientation of Make in India is big business, and a lot of it is defense. My orientation of Make in India would be small and medium businesses. See, big businesses in India already have a lot of play. So my thing would be to carve out a space for small and medium businesses and bring in experts like you from Silicon Valley and actually think about taking these small and medium businesses and transforming them, as I said, into global companies. So I do agree with the the idea of making India, I like it. Orientation slightly different. Uh, you know, Swachh Bharat is something that Mr. Modi likes. The idea of hygiene, I think it's a good one. I don't think it's a bad one. <laughs> you know, uh, and I think I think the sort of stuff that they are doing on open defecation and stuff like that, I think this that's not a bad thing. I think on, on foreign policy, our, our basic design was have relationships with people around us. So we, of course, have a solid relationship with the United States that's only going to get better. And we accept that India and the United States are going to get closer. But we had, but we had a relationship with Russia. We had a certain relationship with Iran. So that balance, for example, Russia today is selling arms to Pakistan. 
It's not in our interest. They've never done it before. I mean, there are reports that the Russians are dealing with the Taliban. Unimaginable. 10, 15 years ago. So, whereas I completely agree with their positioning as far as the US is concerned, I think they're making India vulnerable. Because if you look at Nepal, the Chinese are in there. If you look at Burma, the Chinese are there. If you look at Sri Lanka, the Chinese are there. If you look at Maldives, the Chinese are there. And in a lot of these places, these are tactical mistakes. Nepal was a tactical mistake. You know, the blockade, there's a tactical mistake. You, call, you basically lost Nepal because you made a tactical mistake. So my disagreement in the basic direction, um, my agreement in the basic direction, I agree. Friendship with the United States, close bond with the United States. But don't isolate India because it, it, it gets dangerous. The last question. You should ask the last question. And you know, I think the last question we'll leave on a more personal note for many people in the audience. A lot of us navigating different career options, uh, figuring out bachelor's to master's degree, grad school, then working in the private sector, public sector. You've navigated all of those before. What is your advice and what has your experience been navigating those career options and your advice to the students wow. in this room? That's a, that's a tough one. Um, I, I don't know if you like this or not, but I came to the United States with a sense that there were many things that I could learn in the United States, and with a sense of, you know, I learn a lot of this stuff here, and then I'll take it back to India and apply it, right? And this country... I studied here, and I must say, I'm very fond of this country and the people, especially of the United States of America. And I learned a hell of a lot from here. But what I found was when I took it back and I tried to apply it, you can't apply it directly. Because the, the, the structure and the architecture is completely different. So there's a process of learning from America. And then when you go back, there's a process of learning from India, back relearning from India. And you have to work both those things. You know, the thing I, I learned from college and university, how to deal with people, how to observe people, how to listen to people, that was very powerful. And I think that is the most important thing, much more important than the degree. I mean, I, I learned economics, and you know, I can't recall when I sort of used what I learned in college in, in my work. I mean, it's, it's been a long time. General principles you do use, of course, but specifics, you know, not really. But watching people, listening to them from different cultures, getting a sense of where they're coming from, that's a very powerful thing. Uh, that, that, to me, is something that should be developed. Well, thank you so much. Yeah. It's been a pleasure. And we can hope we get the chance to have more of these conversations. So thank you, everybody. I'm sorry if your question wasn't heard, but thank you. Really. Thank you very much.